Hello. Question for you, Lauren. Um, so recently we've seen protests about um, pipelines. I'm just wondering if there's been a, a pattern, a historical pattern of protest or even tension um, around previous sources of energy. For example, uh, rights of way with um, shipping coal or establishing BC hydro transmission lines, or is this specifically, do you see this phenomenon specifically because of pipelines, because of oil and bitumen? Uh, one, it's too early to say, um, but two, uh, BC Hydro rights of ways um, with the Sons of Freedom and the Duke of Bore movement in the 1950s, there were dynamiting of, of hydro lines at that point. But, so there's, there's one example there. Um, I don't quite know what the reaction w uh, was to the establishment of the, um, the coal port. I haven't looked at that yet. There's been a lot of uh, protests over the uh, um, Burrard Power Station, which is designed to create peak power in the Fraser Valley and, and uh, comes with a lot of, of air pollution. Um, a lot of the things that happen in energy systems, and one of the reasons the Columbia River Treaty came in into play is because the Pacific Northwest uh, had, had reached the, the glass ceiling, so to speak, for energy and they were having um, blackouts at the same time that they wanted to uh, build a titanium plant, which uses four times more energy than aluminum. And uh, if the power goes out on that, you have to scrap the entire industrial plant and everything in it and start again. Um, I'm, but the, the Kitimat um, oil ports inquiry is really interesting to me in 79 because it sets up a model. There's a great deal of voice because hearings are held in communities like NAMU. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, people um, talking from very small northern communities about the implications of a spill for them. Uh, and the testimony is pretty eloquent. That, and, and we're talking 1978, 79. Uh, but there are also hearings in Souk. Uh, and it was the first place that used drift card studies where they dumped them in and then saw where the currents would take things so they could start mapping things out. Um, but but I'm, my interest is not so much in, in a history of protests, but in it as an example of an early attempt at community consultation. And it was rather spectacular, but it was also out of control, over budget, out of timeline, and shut down by the government eventually. But some of the things that are said there are really quite interesting. The idea of Haida Gwaii being an energy system, and that comes out very strongly in the testimony there. And other people saying, you know, I live on the North Coast. Um, I think the speaker was First Nations. Um, and he said, there are no jobs on the North Coast. There's, there's 20,000 of us scattered about. I had to make my own job. It's called a fish boat, and it cost a million dollars, and I employ my sons. And if we can't fish, then we are permanently unemployed, you know. So you start getting those voices coming out in 78, 79. Some of the things that were said in the National Energy Board hearings were regarded at the time as flaky, but often people who are 10 or 20 years ahead of their time are, are sort of looked at that way. But the things that really interest me more than that uh, because that will be seized on and used as justification for some of the contemporary debates. I'm really interested in when an energy system replaces an older one, and nobody protests. So in 1923, we built the last uh, coal, um, the last coal-powered tugboat. And uh, so that doesn't sound very important. But the reason that they made the shift is because uh, you could go up to steam and be sailing in two or three hours. You needed fewer crew. And the same was uh, true for pulp and paper plants. And the same was true, like, uh, who wants to shovel coal in the bottom of a steamship all the way to Yokohama? Uh, so these, what's really interesting about those moments is those are all high-level union jobs. Everybody's a member of a union, yet there's no protests and no one speaks out, and the shift in the energy regime seems to go very smoothly without a lot of social debate. The other thing about that crazy tugboat in 1923 is the government doesn't set out to, to regulate the heavy oil that's replacing that boat 
Tola Royal Commission in 1935, and we have a lot in our provincial archives of the Royal Commissions that look at energy questions. But what I find interesting, uh, right now we're looking at politics and we're looking at social debate and now. Um, but when you look into the past, you find out governments are really slow at regulating things. Uh, it was all over in terms of the industrial economy by 1935. All the pulp plants were using heavy oil. The trains were gone to heavy oil. All the steamships were gone to heavy oil. It was all over and all that was left was for the mines in Nanaimo to close. So sometimes the quiet moments are as important as the boisterous moments. What about, uh, my question to Dr. Hammond is, uh, what about human and animal-based energy systems? I mean, they predate hydro, coal, wood, and have tremendous uh, social implications. So if you, if you could comment on that, maybe that's covered in your book, but it, it seems to me that's an important aspect. Uh, it, it is an important aspect, but it's also covered uh, um, um, by other scholars. That there's, a, okay. there's a study of the Columbia River that views the entire river and its salmon as an energy system. And he draws attention to how, how that energy is dispersed through indigenous communities uh, in, in not just economic ways, not just in social structures, but in spiritual and cultural dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, and the Greece trails are about human transportation of, of, of Ulich and Greece. It's, it, it is an energy trading system and it predates Europeans. It has nothing to do with Europeans. Uh, yeah. You know, many transportation systems are built on top of that. Yeah. But, but we used horses, we used donkeys in order to transport things, and uh, uh, for example. Yeah, um, in, in some of the uh, urban history, one of the odd things that happens as trams come in, the number of animals that are used in cities to move people around actually doesn't decline, it goes yeah. up. Yeah. Because trams are expensive, and so you're only putting them in the city core. Now you need more horses to get people to where the tram lines start. Yeah. And so there's this funny spike as cities use, use up, literally, more horses. Then there comes a point where the system is complete and you don't need horses. And then as the debate with city council just the other day, you know, horses become a social question for other reasons. Yeah. A quick question to Dr. Chung. Dr. Chung, the leg legacy project, to what point in time does it extend? Does it go all the way to today or does it end 10, 20 years in the past because of Punjabi community has a very strong presence in certain industrial sectors, or sectors of our economy where it wasn't present in the past. Thank you for your question. What we are looking at is how we have, this is a group with a shared collective past, that's a very different past, and so what we are looking at is how we connect that that historical moment was today. And so we have, um, for our, our project, there are different themes that go through different historical moments and connect them together so that we can actually, based on this understanding, a better understanding of the past can um, do a better job at community building and heritage preservation for the future. So the present moment is really important to us, for sure. Um, Kim at the back had a question. My question is for Tsi. Um, you said at the beginning of your presentation that it was really important not to essentialize a group. And I interpret that perhaps as reducing a group or reducing um, a culture to just a few ideas or stories. I may have that wrong. Um, what is your advice though if, so if you're working on a, a small exhibit or if you're working on a with an education box and you don't have a whole textbook to describe the history, what are a few tips you have for not essentializing? So the way we are doing with our projects, including Chinese Canadian legacy projects, and this one is, and Kim knows this, because Kim worked on that project as well, um, is uh, actually just speak to different community people and um, people who have this shared collective past but fair, have very diverse interests and very diverse experiences to actually try to facilitate self-expressions 
and in terms of how people consider themselves and how their roles and their identities of the, themselves are situated in this historical moment as a convergence of the past, present, and present. Does that make sense? So you, uh, why did people leave the Punjab at that time, and why did they come to British Columbia? I can talk a long time about <laughs> that, but basically, um, um, one of the very important context that we haven't looked at is the British Empire and how um, both were colonies of British Empire, the previous British Empire, and how um, um, people who, so, so there were a lot of different, different rural areas that needed work opportunities that they didn't have. But because of the network of British Empire, people are aware of the opportunities in British Columbia. So that's my short answer. And I would say the same thing was um, for the gold rush when um, first Chinese Canadians came, first Chinese immigrants came was also because of that network was Hong Kong being a colony. And the news gets into that specific region of Canton easier than the rest of China. Uh, just to add one other thing, which came out of uh, teaching world environmental history. Uh, about 1970, India decided to take strict laws in the Punjab to stop uh, capitalist accumulation, if you will, of large farms out of small family-owned farms. Um, and so that was supposed to protect the individual farmer in the Punjab, but it had an unexpected effect, which was the farmers then signed long-term leases to the same people who wanted to buy their farm and emigrated to the Fraser Valley, where they could work in agriculture, and they had a farm at home, and they had a community here. So that is one of the big distinctions with the immigrants who arrived in the 1970s. They're, um, you could almost say they're fleeing the Green Revolution which has created large-scale agriculture in the, in the Punjab. And they're taking advantage of, of their skill set and, and opportunities here with, with established communities. Yeah, I'm not get, get, getting into the ugly history of the, the, the empire, which actually um, caused a lot of um, oppress, oppressive practices in the region. Erica? Um, Zui, what, what are going to be the outcomes for this project? What are the communities who have been so generous in sharing their stories with us? What are their expectations of us after we've collected all this? Um, not of us, but collabor collaboratively with different or community organizations and our research partner, um, and also the regional partners of museums and Gurdwaras and Casa Diwan societies, is the list what I was talking about. Hopefully, um, we will find funding. And if we find funding together, then um, uh, the K-12 social studies curriculum materials and all these other educational tools that our museum can produce to complement the social studies curriculum, as well as digitization projects and um, um, digital platform and all these other projects that uh, a lot of teams here have been consulted about will happen, hopefully, if funding happens. I'm curious, though, because that was one of the questions I wanted to ask was around, um, <clears throat> Lauren, you touched on the fact that um, uh, industrial history is tough to collect because the objects tend to be very large, macro objects. And Zui, you and I have had this conversation as well about um, building trust with the communities that we're reaching out to and that um, we can't go in there uh, at the beginning and start asking for <laughs> donations of material that we can uh, preserve for future generations. So um, it seems to me, I mean, we're a memory institution and our, and our job is to preserve those stories, but it also seems to me that you're both sort of working in an area that's kind of pushing the envelope in terms of are we collecting objects to preserve history or are we collecting something else? How are we, how are we, how are we exercising our mandate as a museum in the kind of work that you're doing? Uh, I, I would say that there's actually a, a convergence happening, uh, both for the collections, the gallery, the community, wider education. Um, but um, when you take the large industrial communities, 
they have a diverse population. And by bringing out uh, voices that have been fairly silent uh, in, the, in the past in some of those interpretations, uh, we're, we're getting closer to reflecting what British Columbia is today. Um, so I, I think all of these aspects play, it, they all interact in kind of all of our mission, whether it's galleries, school programs, digital outreach, archives, uh, um, or, uh, or how, how we're viewed in, in communities of British Columbians. As tell, are we doing a good job of telling their story? Uh, yeah, are we telling the story that they feel has been neglected or suppressed? I think what we are working on right now is uh, a vision of cultural democratization for the future. And um, that would be, um, we have to do work within our walls, but also beyond. And the kind of collections we are doing, so I've been having a lot of discussions with the digital team managers and head here. And the, the thought is that when it's, we, we don't expect people to give us their family family heirlooms and uh, take it out of the context. And of course there are I items um, that we collect such as the wedding dress where the family really would like to have. But ultimately it's about um, how do we share and mainly creating a platform for sharing this heritage in a meaningful way to advance a better um, society with, which is rooted in a better historical understanding of the past so that we are creating a better future. And that's why um, the digital output would be really important in that uh, the digital platform proposed for this project is one that democratize access in terms of how, for example, our BC Museums Association funding is creating the, the, the 1990 interviews we are collecting right now are accessible online, which is um, fully, fully accessible online to the public. And they don't just belong to the museum, they don't just belong to the university, our research partner, but they become our common um, resource to draw on, and that's just the first step, right? The, the next step would be we look at the patterns of what happened in the past, and we look at the, pa uh, the pattern of um, people's lived experiences and see what kind of work we need to continue to build in terms of um, creating a better understanding cross culture so people can relate and people can understand what other people have struggled to be where we are today. Because we do have different experiences and some people feel that you know why do we even need this kind of work to be done but the the the, the crazy part of it is um if we didn't do this kind of work if the previous people didn't do this kind of work like one of the volunteers for bc archives kept telling me if we were still lived 50 years ago he couldn't have been friends with me because if we were boarding a train i would be confined to another compartment and this, and this is not in distant past, it's actually in the past few decades. So I think just looking at how close these things are to us and how personal these experiences are would help us understand the importance of the fight for social justice. And the kind of work we're doing then is not for only the Punjabi community or Ukrainian community, it's actually for all of us to create a better society and I think that's both with that the work has to happen both be, within and beyond museum walls and the museum really needs to be the beginning point of that cultural democratization go zui <laughs> i think we have time for a couple more questions somebody other in there no okay there. thanks leah uh Tsui, question for you um particularly in the work that you did around um the mills and the logging industry. I'm just wondering if you got a sense from the Punjabi community if they had interactions with other uh, cultural minority groups and ever talked about shared experiences in that sort of, in that workplace environment. 
Yes, um, one of the important elements for this round of cl um, in collection of interviews is um, the BC Museums Association funding specu uh, specified the need to understand the indigenous context, which we have asked questions about that. And it's not just, of course, the indigenous communities, but also other community interactions. BC is all about intercultural. If we are going to separate different cultures, then it's not BC, it's not in Canada. So everything that we do is intercultural in nature, and that is the, the next step of our work in refreshing the permanent gallery in modern history on the third floor. Um, we are going to strive for sharing these intercultural experiences. Yeah, so the, the kiosk is the first step. Um, I, I just say that uh, the, the large mural that's up there of the crane, I, I actually worked in, in that exact spot where that photo was taken. And at that time, there were 600 people in the Ubo mill. It dropped to 175. It had been 600. It was maybe about 350 or 400 when I was there and dropped to 175, closed and is now gone. Uh, but at that particular moment, uh, out of all of the people who worked there, there was one uh, indigenous person who was there on temporary worker hiring day. You know, you get one shift. Uh, and I never saw him again. Uh, and the only indigenous person working in the entire mill was from Ontario. But the same would not be true if you were talking about who was working as fallers and loggers out in the woods in the same valley. So groups were making different choices. Uh, within the, the mill, for example, um, um, Sikhs tended to not completely dominate it, but they helped each other through the courses to become lum lumber graders, which got you 25 cents more an hour, whether you were using your ticket or not. And so the senior graders tended generally to be Sikhs. So there, there were divisions within the mill. There were uh, Sikhs from at least three different temples that had different uh, religious views and different political views on events in the Punjab or events in the valley. You know. So the, there, there was uh, diversity, but it played out quite differently. And it was also a mill in which uh, a young woman uh, uh, went to the Human Rights Board and launched a, a court case uh, demanding that BCFP allow women on green chains. And she won that, uh, uh, that court case and, and was pulling on the green chain when I was there. But she had to force her way in using law. Lauren, I'm wondering if you could speak to us about, you know, first of all, we did have oil and gas drilling off the coast in the late 60s, early 70s, and as a consequence of some of that, that they produced, you know, got a lot of parks along the, the coasts of Vancouver Island and around us. So that was perhaps part of the result of some of that in terms of learning knowledge about uh, what happened offshore, and since then we've done more research uh, associated with knowledge gaining about the offshore. And so what I'm, my question to you is more of how does this affect your work and is there something that we could latch on to here and learning again to the pipelines that are coming down from the interior, potentially coming down from the interior and use some of that knowledge and legislation that happened at that time on the moratorium for instance to somehow go forward? Uh, not in cabinet, <laughs> not my area. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that drilling is really interesting, and it's not well known in Canada that Canada's first domestically made oil rig was made uh, over here uh, by Victoria Machinery Depot in, in 1967, the SEDCO, uh, which, which did drill off Long Beach and uh, between Vancouver Island and Haida Gwaii, uh, did uh, quite, a, quite a number of test drills. Um, there was kind of a, a grand conspiracy between a young cabinet minister called Jean Chrétien and David Anderson of Victoria, who was active in fish and wildlife clubs, which demanded to testify in various hearings, where, uh, and then had asked, asked the weirdest constitutional questions. Uh, but, but the two of them, uh, probably between themselves, schemed to establish Long Beach as a national park, which then had implications for offshore drilling. Uh, but part, uh, part of it is, it's also an exploration. I, I'm not sure if that, that is the moment in which we discovered frozen methane, for example, offshore, off Long Beach. You know, I, I think it's part of that. Um, 
mo most of The community rapidly changed in Long Beach, and it took a completely different direction. Um, so e each of these vignettes, if you will, play out in different ways. They play out, um, wh while I said political debates on the slide, I was really talking about how do governments respond to these? Are they slow? Are they fast? Are they shrewd? Are they caught because they didn't realize it? And I've also found that for other historians writing around North America, other than one who wrote an energy history of California, most people are overly fixated on the story of the car and the mall and the shopping and the freeway. Uh, but, but what I have been learning is that the big dramatic changes in British Columbia are made at an industrial level, not a government level. It's, it's when BC Hydro decides to hook up all their power plants to natural gas and spinning off from that are all the dryers for all the sawmills and the pulp and paper plants. Uh, so it's when those decisions are made that things really start shifting. Uh, at a micro level, we decide, you know, do you want a, an oil furnace or are you going to shift over to electric baseboards or natural gas at a household level? But the really big teeter-totter that sh changes society are, are at these very large industrial levels. I think that's it for this session. Casey, I see your hand up, if you can do it super fast. Uh, well, just briefly, I appreciate the challenges around uh, collecting in these areas, large machinery and new relationships. And I also uh, appreciate the digitization efforts and sharing in a, in a democratic way. But I wonder about the collecting and how this meshes with the museum's collections development and whether we are making attempts in these two areas to document the physical uh, evidence of the stories that you're hearing. Uh, one of the priorities for me is uh, Peace River. The changes in the Peace River have been very dramatic and there's only four or five objects in our collection that reflect the oil and gas industry. It's really not well reflected uh, in the same sense that, say, the aluminum industry or the coal or the lumber industry are in our collections. Uh, so. Um, th that's an area in which I'd like to see us uh, examine what's happened, document the changes that are really sort of post-World War II. I've looked at oil and gas in Peace River in the 1920s and things. Um, but in terms of the collection, how the Peace River really, written large, is a community that feels distance from government, from Victoria, from the Royal British Columbia Museum. And what can we do about that? I think we do a better job with the uh, indigenous communities and the, the natural science communities in the Peace River about what Ken is doing and was talking about this morning and Richard Hebda's work and uh, some of the learning work that's been going on. But in terms of the hi history connections and support for history museums in their community, we could do better there. I was just going to say, Lauren, is, is do we have to collect does, do we, as the Royal BC Museum, have to collect it all, or is there an opportunity to work with other museums in other regions in, in a way of sharing our collections in a way so that collectively those collections tell the story, the provincial story? Uh, it, it's something that, that the institution has gone back and forth. I remember yep. when uh, Bill, Bill Barclay was talking about the idea of virtual collections held by the community with a big database, but the problem is families move, they die out, records go out of date, and that kind of experiment was briefly attempted and didn't really work for the long term. So I'm thinking of uh, when we are collecting, what should we be collecting? as a permanent legacy for the long term in our collection. So we're not talking, we're no longer talking about representative, we are talking about representativeness and inclusion, but at the upper level, we're talking about permanent retention. What is significant to the province that should be in our collection for the long term? Uh, so that if, if I'm from Peace River and I wanna see if I'm in the collection, what's there? And does it reflect the community? Does it have provincial significance? Um, and that's part of the whole process of examining collections and going, you know, we've got an awful lot on trains 
and now there are five decent train museums. Maybe we should have a little less on trains and a lot more on new topics that we haven't collected. So personally, when I'm talking about the collections in terms of internal policy documents, just in a general sense, I'm saying, you know, we're not doing a good enough job on the second half of the 20th century. You know, that's where we should look at. Everybody agrees that the 1920s and the 1910s are important, uh, but we almost have too much material from there and not enough of recent history. We should be, uh, we've talked about intervention collecting. Uh, Tent City was an example of a temporary event that was socially significant that's within our collection. So that's sort of my recommendation at my point in my career uh, to my colleagues about how we should look going forward into the next hundred years. So do you have like a 30 second response? Um, basically, we try to work with communities about um, what they identify as, um, provincially, as provincial, provincially significant and um, regionally significant. And, uh, and then we work collaboratively with re regional and local museums to, to collect. I think we're gonna have to leave it there and move on to session number three. Thank you both very much. <laughs>